Hello, and I'm recording today's episode of a book or two to review on a very sunny day, on a very hot sunny day in the UK. Currently, it's registered as 31 degrees centigrade. So, I'm sorry anyone who's upset about the lighting in here, because I am not covering the door in any way, shape or form, or the window. They're all open, completely. The air is coming through. I have great love for you all, and I hope you're going to enjoy this book review, and I thank you very much for watching, subscribing, and for all the other stuff you do, you know, joining Patreon to support me, joining the channel, all that's wonderful, but no. I'm not closing the curtain. It might get better light effect, it will not, it will also cook me. So this is Skewer by Peter C. Smith, and it's all about the Royal Navy's dive bomber, of course. One of the most misunderstood aircraft in World War II, principally because the RN ends up making the decision that unless you have bigger carriers, it's better to have a fighter, which can occasionally do some bombing, rather than have a dive bomber, which can do the fighting. This is because, despite in actually shooting down aircraft, and that's the scariest thing, the skewer did shoot aircraft down. It might have been slower than pretty much anything else up there at the point, and its replacement might well have been planned, because what the RN was planning, of course, was that they were bringing in the Albacore to replace the Swordfish, and then they were going to have the Barracuda, which was going to be a torpedo bomber and dive bomber. It's going to be able to do both roles. They were going to combine the strike roll into this super aircraft that would do both. All sensible if you've got smaller air groups because you're exchanging air group mass under treaty limitations for ship survivability based on operating the other side of the world from your supply lines and your infrastructure or operating the Mediterranean where pre-radar you ain't gonna have any warning in that time before the enemy strike gets to you. So those two criteria make armoured carriers a suitable thing for the RN if they want to have you, know, you can have the, a lovely great big carrier that's true but with lots of aircraft on but you'll only have it for the first day of the war is basically the British idea it will get hit and to get taken out of action and either need to go all the way home to be repaired or it'll get sunk either way that's not much help for you on day two so that's their policy but this means this aircraft is always fighting against the odds. And you can see in its deployments, because really it's deployed to the strike carriers. It's deployed to Arc Royal, it's deployed to Courageous and Glorious. Those are the ships which have large enough air groups, are large enough carriers, that they can make use of it. Now, Peter Smith and I have a relationship which is interesting because we've never actually met, although I would love to meet him. Because he regularly writes not nice things about tribal class destroyers, in my opinion. And whilst I agree with him in praising the J-class and other destroyer types, I think he gets the tribals a bit wrong. So, for me to say one of his books is very, very good, it's not that difficult. But it still, you know, sticks a little bit. This is a very, very good book. This is chapter 3, the Saga of the Dive Bombing Site. The RAF's total opposition to dive bombing had a malevolent effect on the Royal Navy's attempts to adopt the dive bomber and make it an even more effective weapon system. The need for a fully automatic dive bombing site had long been apparent, and in Germany and Sweden, the venom work proceeded a pace in the 1930s. However, Neither of the other two major navies that had developed aircraft carriers went down this route. The Americans certainly strove for such a dive bomb site and produced designs, but they found little favour with the pilots themselves, who on the whole tended to prefer their open eye own eye sighting. The case of the Royal Navy was different. Such a dive bombing site was thought highly necessary and desirable, 
But obfuscation on the part of the Air Ministry hampered them at every turn. Lobbying by the Royal Navy eventually resulted in the establishment of the Dive Bombing Site, a Dive Bomb Site Subcommittee of the Bombing Committee, which had its first meeting at the Air Ministry on the Monday, the 11th of May, 1936. Representing the Air Ministry were the Chairman, Air Commodore A. W. Teller, Group Captain A. Gray, Squadron Leader C. N. H. Bilney, and Mr. I. Bowen, along with Air Commodore L. A. Patterson of the Armour Group. Mr. F. W. Meredith of the Royal Aero Engin Air Engineering, RAE, and Flight Lieutenant G. E. G. Brockman, acting as Secretary. In the face of this ocean of light blue prejudice, the Royal Navy Solitude Representative was Commander G. M. B. Langley, OB N. A. D. The committee's terms of reference were modified and were given as ensuring that any dive bomb site development conformed to operational requirements as far as they can be met, testing of such sites under service conditions, suggesting tactics appropriate to any particular site which is found practicable, suggesting appropriate methods of training. The Royal Navy advanced their requirement, which was for a site capable of use against a moving target. It's necessary for this important point to be made clear from the outset. However, AMRD proposed that just a simple site for dive bombing against a stationary target be produced. This would have a setting for wind with a predetermined angle of di uh, dive, direction of dive, defined by wind direction, and height of bomb release of 1,500 feet. The Air Ministry had their way, and the rest of the discussion proceeded on the basis that the Royal Navy's requirement could best be achieved by the preliminary development of a simple site. For the purpose of warfare at sea against high-speed targets, i.e. Japanese aircraft carriers, the whole ballast and basis of development was practically useless from the start. This was not the end of the setbacks for the Royal Navy, for it had been agreed previously that bomb release height would be increased. 2,000 feet was more suitable than 1,500 feet, Mr. Meredith put forward the opinion that it might be possible to design a site with both these heights as built-in options. The committee decided that should this prove impractical, the height should be 2,000 feet. Some very naive suggestions were made by the Air Ministry officials with regard to methods of ascertaining the wind direction prior to an attack. They put forward two methods by which they thought this could be done. One, by smoke from funnels of ships to be attacked, and two, by smoke caused by a preliminary attack with anti-personnel bombs or smoke generators. It took Commander Langley very little time to demolish both these nonsensical suggestions. In the first place, he had to enlighten his RAF colleagues that modern warships actually made very little smoke from their funnels, even during sudden changes of speed unless they made smoke deliberately as a screen, in which case they're not able to be seen. With regard to the second point, even disregarding the obvious fact that any such preliminary attack would eliminate one of the dive bomber's greatest assets, surprise, Langley pointed out two obvious other obvious facts. For a start, if the preliminary bombing was to be of any value whatsoever, these small bombs would themselves have to be accurately replaced, and if that was the case, then so also could the main bombing attack itself. Also, if assumed that any en an enemy fleet would take no further avoiding action once a preliminary attack had been made, also rather an unlikely scenario. Commander Langley had to point out that any enemy fleet would have first to be located and then shadowed continually so that the attacking force could be guided to the target. The shadowing aircraft themselves, if they survived the attention of the enemy's defending fighters, could ascertain wind direction and speed over the target fleet and duly transmit this information as part of their continued monitoring of the situation. The dive bombing force could then adapt its approach accordingly, and using an ordinary compass could define the line of advance of its target fleet. Commander Langley opined that the pilot and the man in the back seat were quite capable of making these adjustments, which could be worked out and set as soon as the ships were sighted. Hence, another reason you need a person in the back. If you're going to be doing advanced maths and working all this stuff out, then you need someone who can actually sit there and writing stuff, rather than concentrating on flying the plane. In the face of such logic, the agreement was that the wind estimation using smoke was tactically impossible. And that the necessary adjustments for it would have to be computed by other methods. When it came to considering that what cut type of current warplanes in Great Britain's inventory would be capable of delivering such dive bombing attacks, an equal degree of unreality prevailed, while such proponents of the dive bomber as the fledgling Luftwaffe the Royal Navy, the Imperial Japanese, the United States, uh, United States Navy, all thought of 70 degrees as the ideal angle of dive. The RAF stated that permissible diving angles could be ve vary according to types, and that heavy bombers would be able to dive at angles of up to 30 degrees. Uh, 
just having a mental image of a Lancaster doing a 30 degree dive attack, a dive bombing attack. This of course was not dive bombing at all, but shallow glide bombing, a very different and far less accurate type of bomb delivery. The types the RAF proposed to use were listed as the Blenheim, the Battle, the Wellesley, and the Whitley. Not one of them built with any dive bombing capability. The fleet air on types were given as the Shark, the Swordfish, and the dive, bombing, uh, dive Bomber Reconnaissance Fighter Dive Bomber. Of these, the first two were Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance Aircraft, uh, response, t Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance Aircraft, I've discussed both length in my channel. First and foremost, and biplanes to boot. Um, again, I'm not, uh, again, this problem of biplanes. Only the latter, the still on the drawing board, drack of, uh, drawing board, jack of all trades skewer, had any real dive bomber pretensions, even if they were sent lessened by commitments to all its other assigned tasks, i.e. dive bomber, reconnaissance fighter, dive bomber. Um, uh, I would, yeah, it's a complicated one. I, I think that should be dive bomber reconnaissance fighter, rather than Reco oh maybe reconnaissance fighter dive bomber. All seems rather complicated to be DBRFDB. No, if you put, uh, put it in anagrams, anyway. Another divergence of opinion followed. It had been pointed out that the, 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 during dive bombing trials with the Hawker Hart light bomber, a biplane, the bomb's impact point in a no-wind condition was barely within the pilot's range of vision, and that in an upwind attack it would not be visible at all. This was a serious limitation, tactically, on the flexibility of any attack. The Royal Aero Establishment, RAE, I think I called them Royal Aero Engineering earlier, that's the, that's the later name. I don't remember correctly. Um, or is it? <sighs> RAE. Had suggested the adoption of an integrated accelerometer to overcome this problem. But Mr. Meredith announced another solution. This was a cheap and simple gyroscope, which would be wired up to all the bomb releases. During the initial stage of the attacker's pull-out from the dive, this would automatically release the bomb. He claimed that as the bomb release would be directly affected concurrent with the pullout, it would release the pilot from the task of synchronizing both, and thus ensure a more accurate distribution of the weapons dropped. The RAF members found this recommendation not to their, to their, their taste. The cost of extra wiring was cited as one reason for not adopting it. Again, Commander Langley was in a minority of one when he stated that, in his opinion, the increased accuracy from the resulting better distri distribution would completely justify this method. After all, wiring is incredibly expensive. Moreover, he again had to state the obvious, which was that as fleet air aircraft, <laughs> fleet air aircraft had no level bombing mission or instrumentation whatsoever, their aircraft's internal wiring had already been reduced. Taylor took another tack. He thought the introduction of any new method involving installation complications was justified, or that any that weapon distribution would be that much improved. He cited photographic evidence of the spread of stick bombs from the Coastal Defense Development Unit. Perhaps forgetting that in dive bombing, it was a single bomb that accurately hit the target that counted, rather than a stick, which merely straddled it. Accuracy, for accuracy's sake, seems to have been universally eradicated from the RAF's mindset during the 1930s and 1940s, their only vision being cities laid waste by area attacks. In the end, a typical compromise was reached, whereby, although it was agreed that the hypothetical impact point of the A-line would be within the pilot's vision, the impact point of the bomb, the B-line, often would not. Uh, there, some method of bomb re release during the pullout from the dive as the B-line crossed the target ought ideally to be evolved, and if this could be done by a gyro release system, so much the better. The sting was again in the tail. It was emphasized that the practical complications in regard to production and maintenance which might be involved must be borne in mind. <sighs> Mr. Meredith's next suggestion also received a rough ride. He proposed fitting a contacting altimeter with a visual sight line to indicate when the correct bomb release height had been reached during a dive. He explained that the provision of a lamp, possible in a bead foresight, in a bead foresight could be automatically triggered by such a device. This would mean that the pilot could concentrate on his attack and not have to take his eyes off the target. Mr. Bam was enthusiastic, suggesting this device could be married with the gyroscopic device discussed earlier. 
Again, the RAF representatives were lukewarm. If the device failed, any pilot they had come, that had come to rely on it would be at a loss. Indeed, he might not even know when he had passed the correct release height. The chairman also opposed it, but from the opposite point of view, a variation in height of 200 to 300 feet did not really make much difference to bombing accuracy. Most dive bombers and bomb pilots would have vehemently challenged that viewpoint, but of course, Tedder had nobody with that knowledge and expertise to oppose him. Once more, the Royal Navy representative was the lone voice from the services in favour on several grounds, not least the opportunity to avoid barrages of fire from the fleet. Tedder was adamant that too many complications should not be introduced. With regard to anti-aircraft fire, in war, risks would have to be and would be accepted. The presentation of such an attractive target as a warship would be a strong incentive to pilots to come lower. The idea was thought to have some merit of training for training purposes and should be tried out, but its adoption was ruled out until it could be proven that it had it increased accuracy. An RAE idea to set the contacting altimeter for sea level barometric, uh, barometric pressure either by the pilot sending the sea level for timing, uh, sea level, or timing the fall of a practice bomb, was ruled out for the same obvious reasons as earlier for wind direction estimate. The committee then went on to consider whether a multi-directional site should not be given the go-ahead. Again, it was Meredith who thought that, to remove limitations in the direction of attack imposed by the site, as we discussed, a site comprising two concentric rings with radial spokes could be painted on the aircraft windscreen. He envisaged the pilot positioning the target so that the smoke lay a line lay along a radius of these circles and the wind strength could be estimated from the radial distance of the target from the centre. The pilot would need to have his head correctly positioned for this work and should have a bead foresight and a headset to ensure he was correctly aligned. Once more, it had to be pointed out that for the system to be effective, it depended on smoke being visible from the ships under attack. And this had already been rejected as impractical. How about the ensigns and flags of the ships being a good indication of wind direction instead of smoke? One wonders just what less scientific method the air lobby could have come up with than this, which was more attuned to 17th century naval warfare than 20th century air warfare. Yet the majority were all for it, as it embodied the right ring sight principle, already well known to pilots and overcame the single directional restriction. It offered great, uh, greater flexibility. The only modification was that instead of painting the rings on the windshield, which might impair the efficiency of the reflector sight, thin metal rings could be utilized that could be swung into position when needed. Commander Langley then stated that features that would totally meet admiralty requirements in a dive bomb site would be an automatic or manual setting uh, for the angle of dive and our height. These additional requirements were, however, deferred, but action on the other recommendations could proceed forthwith. This latter point, at least, would mean progress at last. Unfortunately, despite the wording, it did not happen. Okay. I have, as I've said many times, great respect for the RAF as a body. They have... Their airmen fought very, have fought very hard in many wars. I have to admit this, though. Their senior leadership in the 1930s were nuts. And... You read this book and... Smith is trying to be as balanced as he can be. As balanced and as polite as he can be. And there is limitations to even what he can achieve. It is a good book. It has some very interesting stuff in here. And you learn a lot about naval aviation in the 1920s and 30s thanks to it. It also has some lovely diagrams. Which include the bomb hits on the Koenigsberg. Illustrations of the site in the various positions. Some great diagrams of the actual structure in the aircraft. And some really cool pictures. At the end, you're left wishing that the Royal Navy had somehow had a couple of thousand extra tons or more in the design of the illustrious class. And had managed to make them 48. Still the armoured deck, but 48 aircraft ships uh, with 12... 
four miles, 12 skewers, and 24 swordfish. That would have been a pre-war plan. The moment it got into wartime, they would have realized they wanted 18 full miles, or at least 18 fighters. So it would have probably gone down from, gone to 18 full miles, 18 swordfish, and 12 skewers. Or the skewers would have filled in, because let's be honest, if you've got 12 of them and 12 full miles, you've got 4 1939-1940, an okay air defense group. It's not brilliant, but it's not that bad either. It's got, it's something. Either way, that's what you're left leaving this book with. And you then wonder, would the Royal Navy have pushed on more? Who knows? But definitely when you read this book, and once you get through it, you realise that just how good Blackburn were and you also realize, the more you go into this topic, just how many backroom deals the Navy was having to pull to get even this going in the air. Smith covers it as best he can, but as I've said before, there are limitations. What you can put in a book is stuff you can absolutely rely on and you can prove. What I can say online, because I can admit it, I can say I can't prove this. I have a strong suspicion based on my readings, but I have no smoking gun. I can be honest on that front. And my honest thinking is that the site and various other things might well have been in development a lot longer than the RAF knew they were in development, or the Air Ministry knew they were in development, because... They all come from companies which the Royal Navy has naval contracts with already, which they're paying large amounts of money for already. Okay, maybe those companies were developing on spec. Maybe the Royal Navy and the Admiralty looked the other way as they padded the costs slightly on a couple of the other orders to fund that development. We will never know. But it's a strong possibility in my mind. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this, and I hope you'll look out for the rest to come. Link, as ever, and ISBN number down below. Link to my Amazon system, where I get a couple of pennies occasionally when people order it for it. Thank you. Take care.